Hi, I'm Fraser Nelson, editor of the uh, Spectator magazine, and for the next 30 minutes we're going to have a, um, a change of topic, looking at the health of the social fabric and what is going wrong. This should technically be the best time in the world to be young, the best time to start a family. There have never been greater opportunities for um, education, for entertainment, for travel, for access to information on a scale previous generations would never have imagined. And yet we're living through something, of, something approaching a mental health crisis in Britain and in the US, um, especially pronounced amongst young people. The number of um, students at university, for example, um, reporting mental health issue in Britain has gone up four times in the last 15 years for reasons that scholars are still trying to understand. So we're going to hear from two people now. First is Miriam Cates, a, a Tory MP who's been campaigning on this issue since she entered Parliament four years ago. And from Professor Jonathan Haidt, who's going to be joining us via video link from New York. But to start us off, we're going to watch this short video to put things all in context. We are still bowling alone. The pins that connect a flourishing society are being hit hard. Robert Putnam's thesis is as true today as when it was first written at the turn of the century. He painted a picture in the West of the fragmentation of the social fabric. But sadly, the trends have continued to decline. Trust in institutions is falling dramatically in Western democracies. Only 37% of the population in the UK now trust the government, the same proportion that say they trust the media. The family unit, connected through the bond of marriage, is disappearing from this generation. Weddings have now fallen by a quarter across OECD nations since 1990. The proportion of children being born outside of a stable relationship has increased in the developed world and this is now the new norm. And birth rates in top economies and much of the world have hit record lows. The quality of our relationships impact how we see ourselves and our ability to connect with those around us. Strong families mean greater personal resilience, healthier behaviours and higher self-esteem, meaning that today's breakdown of the family unit is having an immense psychological and social impact in our culture. Turning these numbers around needs more than just time. To repair a social fabric that's been torn means rediscovering the obligation of one generation to the one that came before, and the one that is yet to come. At ARC, we want to see families and children restored to the centre of our societies. There is a better story. Please welcome our first speaker, Miriam Case. Thank you, Fraser. Not so long ago, we thought that the West had triumphed. Western society, with its defining attributes of freedom, prosperity, and happiness, was believed by some to be the pinnacle of civilization. In 1992, Fukuyama famously wrote that we be, may be witnessing the end of history, the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. But today, the Western idea seems anything but final or universal. Those triplet trophies of freedom, prosperity and happiness, more fragile than at any time since the war. But our decline has not been brought about by military defeat or economic collapse or natural disaster. Rather, it's come from within, from the fraying of our social fabric, the network of associations that holds together our families, our neighbourhoods and our nations. The surest sign of Western decline can be found in the evidence of demographic change. By definition, a successful civilization is one that endures. But the fall in fertility rates across the West 
threatens the future existence of our society. If bringing a child into the world is a sign of hope for the future, then in the West, that hope is in short supply. As Paul Morland and Philip Pilkington's paper for this conference makes clear, unless fertility rate decline is reversed, we are heading for a future of certain economic stagnation or destabilizing mass immigration or both. But we don't need warnings about the future to alert us to decline. We can feel the social fabric fraying around us at every level of society, family, neighborhood, our nations, our social covenant, that shared understanding of identity and responsibility is under strain. Nowhere is this strain more evident than in the erosion of family life. The family is the building block of society. The family is the unit that ensures children are fed, loved, protected, nurtured, and raised in the virtues they need to become the responsible citizens of tomorrow. But family breakdown has become epidemic, with nearly half of British children experiencing the dissolution of their parents' relationship. The collapse of marriage rates, particularly among low-income groups, has exacerbated poverty and disadvantage. The impact of family breakdown on children is profound. It is the single biggest predictor of poor teen mental health and correlated with worse outcomes in every aspect of adult life. The support of extended family has been weakened and loneliness increased as young people have moved away from their communities. One in seven British adults now takes antidepressants and suicide is the most common cause of death for young men. Our families are in crisis and the social fabric of our neighbourhoods is also unravelling. Shrinking membership organisations and religious attendance have eroded a sense of common purpose, a reluctance to prosecute petty crimes like shoplifting and a failure to integrate immigrants have eroded social trust. Deindustrialization and globalization have ripped the economic heart out of many of our towns. At its peak, the steelworks in Stocksbridge, a town in my constituency, was not only the source of good employment for over 10,000 local men, it also founded many of the town's civic institutions. Fewer than 750 people now work in that steelworks. And as manufacturing has declined, communities have been left bereft without a shared economic endeavor. Our families, our neighborhoods are caught in a spiral of decline. And our nations, well, the last few weeks have shattered any remaining illusions that our nations are cohesive or united, as those who hate the West have marched on many of our great cities. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. At every level, family, nation, neighborhood, we are increasingly weak and divided. Unless we can find a way to repair our social fabric, the decline will surely be terminal. So how did this decline occur? How, in the pursuit of freedom, prosperity and happiness, are we losing all three? While well, the trauma and the suffering of the world wars gave way to hedonism, after witnessing the appalling consequences of authoritarianism, we were determined to end all forms of oppression. But in doing so, we began to mistake all boundaries for tyranny, throwing off established, shared norms and values that were the source of our freedom, rather than its antithesis. Boundaries such as marriage, the sanctity of life, parental responsibility, shared heritage and traditions, duty to our nations. Without these cultural guardrails, our social fabric unraveled. And in the words of my friend Danny Kruger, the order of our mutually dependent common life together gave way to the idea of the individual as a fully autonomous agent. The idea began to distort the noble aims of freedom, prosperity, and happiness. Where once we understood freedom as possessing the virtues to control and regulate our desires, we now perceive it as the right to complete individual autonomy, even freedom from material reality. Where once we understood prosperity as the ability of families and communities to provide for themselves, we now pursue superficial GDP growth at all costs, even when that means mounting debt, widening inequality, and devaluing care for the young and the old. 
and where happiness was once seen as the fortunate byproduct of a combination of luck and a well-ordered life, we began to seek instead the avoidance of all emotional discomfort. When the cracks began to show, when the idea met reality, instead of retracing our steps, we doubled down. And we began to look to the state to provide, where our hollowed out families and communities had failed. Nowhere are the disastrous results of this distorted pursuit of freedom, prosperity and happiness more evident than in the damage being done to our children. To use a very practical illustration, consider the rising number of young children who start school in the UK still wearing nappies or diapers, for some of you in the room. Now, I never thought I'd make a speech about toilet training to 1,500 world leaders, but please bear with me. Now, it might sound like a trivial issue, but the cost to schools is, is considerable. In fact, it's unaffordable with additional full-time paid adults required just to change nappies and clear up mess. And the long-term cost to those children is immense. A child who's not been trained in this most rudimentary of skills by the age of five has little chance of being trained in all of the other essential skills and virtues required for a successful life. Just 20 years ago, it would have been unthinkable to send a child to school in nappies, but now 90% of reception teachers report having children in their class who are not toilet trained. How has this happened? Well, toilet training is difficult. I've done it three times successfully, I must say. It, thank you. It involves, <laughs> it involves getting your hands and most of your house dirty. It's not a pleasant experience for parent or child, but it's necessary. From parents, it requires the sacrifice of individual autonomy to stay physically close to your child at all times. Potty training can take weeks of dedication to the task. This is increasingly impossible when our GDP-obsessed economic system demands that even mothers of small children leave their infants in daycare to return to the workplace. And successful potty training requires a firm belief that a child's emotional discomfort is sometimes necessary in the short term for his or her long-term best interests. But our understanding of happiness has become so distorted that many parents now believe they should do whatever it takes to shield their child from discomfort, a belief that's incompatible with successful potty training or indeed the training of a child in any virtues. In a number of other different trends, soaring childhood obesity, smartphone addiction, children who believe they can change their gender, or those who are addicted to violent pornography, we see the consequences for children of the fraying of our social fabric. We now have an emerging generation who have never experienced the security of a strong social fabric, who've lost hope in ever enjoying the same freedom, prosperity, and happiness as their parents and grandparents. Crippled with anxiety, without the boundaries of social norms, robbed of economic capital by our addiction to debt, fearful of offence because we've taught them to be defined by their feelings. To many of our young, society is a failure and they have become a fertile breeding ground for an ideological radicalism that seeks to overturn, to subvert what's left of our social fabric. As a politician and normally an optimist, I'm usually asked to offer solutions, but I've drawn the short straw at this conference and have been charged instead with the depressing task of describing the problem. But permit me to offer this. Freedom, prosperity and happiness are not values. They're not a map. They're not even principles. They may be the fruits of a successful society, but they're not its roots. No good tree bears bad fruit. And to restore the fruit, we must first attend to the roots. The true roots, the foundation stones of Western civilization are not freedom, prosperity, and happiness, but the pursuit of the good, the true, and the beautiful. This was our story, and over the next few days, we will explore together how it can be our better story again. If we seek first the good, the true, and the beautiful, Perhaps true freedom, prosperity, and happiness can be ours once more. Thank you.
Thank you, Miriam. Now, I'm going to try with the wonders of technology to summon, summon Professor Haight from the um, cybersphere. I'm not quite sure. Ah, great. Jonathan, can you hear me? We I hear you. Do you hear me? Give me a thumbs up or something. It's, it's working. It looks like it's morning in America over there. Um, All great. right. Well, well, thanks for joining us from, from New York. Now, um, Jonathan, Miriam spoke in there about family breakdown and mental health. You've been doing a lot of work on the relationship between social media and mental health. You've got a new book coming on this theme next year. Um, two questions. How strong is the link so far? And also, does it, can you say a bit more about the demographics? Are, is what you're seeing uh, universally applied amongst all young people, or are there some groups for whom the effect is more pernicious than others? Yes. Well, thank you. Um, what, what a pleasure to be here. In the last week, I've gotten uh, uh, share or visiting requests from so many people that I want to meet. I'm so sorry that I'm not there with you, uh, but I had to actually hide away to finish this book. Um, so here we are. Um, on your question, uh, so let me just give you the big picture here. Um, something happened around 2012. Um, it, it showed up, it began to show up with weirdness on campus in 2014 that led me and Greg Lukianoff to write the Coddling of the American Mind article. We tried to figure out what caused this weird new morality, these terrible ideas. We thought maybe social media has something to do with it, but we didn't know in 2015. <laughs> then we wrote our book, in, uh, published in 2018, and now we had a little more evidence, but still it wasn't, it wasn't crystal clear in the, in the scientific literature. Um, and even today, it's not crystal clear when we look at the published research. But when we look all around us, you talk to the teachers, you talk to the psychologists, you talk to the parents, you talk to members of Gen Z. Nobody defends this phone-based childhood. <clears throat> Everybody sees the problems. Um, and what I have found, and Jean Twenge is a research partner here with me, um, is that the if you plot out the trend lines for depression and anxiety, self-harm and suicide, <clears throat> they're relatively flat until around 2010. Um, and then, all over the English-speaking world, they start shooting up around 2012 plus or minus a year. In fact, just 10 minutes ago, uh, uh, my research assistant and I put up a post showing that rates of suicide are at peak levels across the Anglosphere, but only for girls. Uh, so I think this is a real discovery. You'll, you, you'll see the post on my, on my substack. Um, so anyway, I'm sorry to give you a, a, a shorter answer. What we're seeing um, is a very sharp, sudden um, uh, change in girls' mental health all around the Anglosphere and the Nordic countries. It's the same thing. Uh, and this will relate back to the previous talk. It's in those countries where there was a lot of independence and, and young people were not deeply rooted in communities, in religious communities, and in families. There's a lot of individualism. In those countries, when everything changed around 2012, all the kids got smartphones, or they all went on, the girls all went on Instagram, um, it's right around then that in the, in, in the uh, Anglo and Nordic countries, the girls especially get washed away. And you cannot grow up in networks. You have to grow up in communities. Um, I'll just add two other variables to this when you asked about individual differences. Um, we have plots on some graphs I'll, I, I, I would show, or I'll, I'll, uh, you can find them in my Substack post, showing that it's especially, uh, it's not just girls, it's girls on the left and it's uh, secular conservatives. So if you're, a religious, if, if you're a kid who's a religious conservative, on average your mental health is not really much worse than it was 10 years ago. But if you're a secular liberal girl, you probably, literally, like more than half say, uh, a mental, uh, I have been told that I have a mental health uh, d problem. So those are the main demographics about what's happening. We're here to talk about the fragmentation of society and the future um, of what I think is the, the best way to live together, which is the, the Anglo-style the, the Anglo uh, liberal democracy. But if we are, if the next generation has such severe levels of anxiety and fragility and has so little experience collaborating with people who think differently than them. For all the talk about diversity, many of them can't handle working with someone who voted the other way. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I guess I'm here to bring more of this litany of bad news about current indicators, and I hope in our discussion we'll, we'll be talking about how to turn that around. Right. So can you say a bit more about that? So you're saying amongst the young people who uh, go to church, synagogue, or mosque, that they're less susceptible 
to the mental health side effects of social media than those who don't have religion in their lives. That's right. So there's several reasons for this. Um, so if we just focus on social media, it's uh, liberals use it more than conservatives, and liberal girls use it the most. So Jean Twenge says it might just be that the liberal girls, are, are spend, they spend so many hours a day on social media, and it's incredibly bad for your mental health, whereas uh, conservative, uh, uh, conservative religious kids don't. Um, but I think it's a lot more than that. And what I've learned while writing the book, I began by focusing on social media. But I now see that it's not just social media. It's what I've been calling the phone-based childhood. So for all of human history, for millions of years, you know, all mammals play. Like we, mammal childhood is about building up your brain, and you do that through play. Anyone who's had a puppy knows it's all about play. Um, so we had play-based childhoods up until around 2010. Uh, I've seen data in Britain. I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was something like, you know, 60% of British kids in 20, 2009, 2010, 60 percent of them used to go over to a friend's house uh, sometimes you know, each week. And then by 2015, that had dropped to something like 20 percent. I may be wrong on the numbers, but the thing is, kids used to actually see each other in person. And once they all got phones and loaded with social media for the girls, uh, it's video games for the boys, childhood stops being play-based, which is what a mammal brain needs to wire up properly. It stops being play-based. It becomes phone-based where phone includes video game consoles, all the stuff that makes your, your social interactions virtual, often asynchronous, disembodied, uh, transitory. Um, so it's a complete, what I'm, I'm calling it, the great rewiring of childhood. It happened between 2010 and 2015. It hit the US, Canada, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, exactly the same way. The, the, uh, New Zealand's a little bit later, but the US, UK, Canada are exactly in lockstep about what happened to our kids' mental health. Right. Now, does the research say anything about which platforms are better than others? I mean, for, for example, I, I can't imagine, I, I've got two teenage boys, 13 and 15. I've got a girl who's 10 years old, just young enough for me to read your research and stop her from what lies ahead. But, um, but, but do you find, for example, that, um, that Instagram is more pernicious than, I don't know, Twitter? I guess kids don't really use LinkedIn. But, but you know, it, it's, you, you've got to be careful to, use, to, to lump all social media together. Mm -hmm. That's right. So a, a really helpful distinction can be made between what we used to call these things, which were social networking systems. Networks are useful to adults. There's no doubt about that. LinkedIn is very useful. People use it to advance their purposes. So all of these things, including Facebook, used to be called social networking systems. You can do a Google Trend search on that, and you'll see that term rose very high. And then that term begins to drop in the 2010. We don't call them that anymore. Um, after 2009, the, um, they became much more viral. We got the like button, the retweet button. It's not about connecting people. It's now about performing on a platform. And so we now call them social media platforms. Now, platforms can be useful to adults, too, if you want to yell and scream and shout and promote your brand. So these things are not very good for adults, but we let adults make their choices. Um, um, what about kids? Should, so, should children grow up playing with each other and sometimes getting into arguments and fights between the two of them and then working it out? Or is it better if they all stand on a platform where they can say things in public, including to strangers, uh, and then they can be publicly shamed by potentially millions of people? <clears throat> um, some of those kids then commit suicide. Uh, the case of Molly Russell in the UK is, is the famous one, but we have many, many in the US as well. Um, so uh, to give a more concise answer, um, social networks are useful for adults. I don't believe social networks are useful at all for children. Children should not be on social networks. They should be playing in person. Social media platforms should never be accessed by children until they're 18. Um, it's just insane that we let kids do these things that can ruin their lives. Um, so so uh, Instagram is the worst for teen mental health for girls because of the social comparison. Uh, and also, there's all kinds of new forms of bullying that take place on Instagram. TikTok uh, is probably the worst for their intellectual development. I think it, it literally reduces their ability to focus on anything while stuffing them with little bits of stuff that was selected by an algorithm for emotional arousal. Uh, not for truth, for emotional arousal. I don't know if you talked about this yet at the conference, but the fact that uh, almost half of American Gen Z says, if given the choice between do you support Israel, or do you side more with Israel or Hamas, which way do you go? The great majority of Americans side with Israel, except for Gen Z, which is split 
And there was a Twitter thread recently showing how if you, if you look at what people are seeing on TikTok, you can understand why. TikTok is probably the most, uh, TikTok and Twitter are incredibly dangerous for our democracy. I'd say they're incompatible with the kind of liberal democracy that we developed over the last few hundred years. Uh, but Instagram is the worst for girls' mental health. But if, say, somebody listening to you here thinks, OK, my, this is my big takeaway from ARC. I'm going to go home and tell my kids to stop using social media. We can imagine the response. They'll say, look, mm -hmm. dad, mom, you are basically severing me from my social network. You don't understand how it is. A social network is digitized now. Yep. So, so you're basically a generation behind. It's, it's, like, it's like Grand saying that you're watching television too much. You're telling me I use social enough. If you do this, that's it. My social life goes. Thank you. That's a perfect statement of what we call a collective action problem. Uh, in, in the social sciences, especially economics, there's a lot of research on collective action problems. It's just what you described. Any one person doing the right thing is in big trouble. Uh, there, nobody wants to have their kid be isolated. Why do we ever let our kids on social media? It's only because of the dynamic you just said. And what that means is that we have to look to the literature on how you solve collective action problems. And the main ways are you, if you can set norms and if you can have laws and policies. So I'd like to set a norm right here. Um, um, here's a very, here, so I'm suggesting four norms in my book. And, and these are all ways to solve collective action problems. And we can all do them, even though the US Congress may never do anything to help us. Although, of course, the UK Parliament is, is doing great work. Here they are. Uh, norm number one. Um, uh, no smartphones before high school, which in the US is, is grade nine, around age 14. Just don't give your kids a smartphone, but they'll be cut off. No, you give them a flip phone. The millennials had flip phones. They texted each other, see you at four at the mall, and then they would meet at the mall. Um, so just don't give a smartphone to your 10-year-old. To your wait till 14, wait, or high school. Um, we have to think about especially saving elementary school and what we call middle school. Uh, if we can get the phones out of there, the collective action problem is solved, and those kids will not have phone-based childhoods. Rule number two, um, no social media before 16. Um, so if, it's, you know, if your kid is the only one who's not on Instagram at, at 12, it's very hard on her. Um, but what if half the kids are not on Instagram? Now, do you feel as a parent you could say, well, you know what? Half, half the kids in your grade are on Instagram, half are not? No, no, you're not getting this till you're 16. Um, Kids are terrified of being the only one, cut off, left out. But if half the kids are not on social media and they actually meet up after school and they do fun things, they'll become the cool kids. Um, third rule, um, phone-free schools. Get phones out of schools. And I've got to say, once again, uh, the UK, and well, in, I don't know, you know England, uh, the, your health minister, or uh, education minister, I'm sorry, declared that all schools in England should go phone-free. I just want to put in the plug that that does not mean uh, you can keep it in your backpack. That's better than nothing, but really to make it phone free because the kids are so addicted, it needs to be you put them in a locked uh, a phone locker or in a yonder pouch. Otherwise, the kids are going to go to the bathroom, they'll find ways to get their fix. Um, that's rule three phone free schools. And rule four is far more free play uh, and uh, for unsupervised play and childhood independence. Both of our countries freaked out in the 90s, locked up our kids because of we, we lost trust in each other. We thought everyone's a child molester or rapist. Uh, there's a great book, Paranoid Parenting, by Frank Ferretti, British sociologist. Um, so those, that's it. If we do those four things, and if, even if half of us do them, we solve the collective action problems. Right. Now, in your, um, much of your work, you've, especially in The Righteous Mind, you've emphasized how important it is to pay attention to those who disagree with you on the other end of the spectrum. Now, there are people here who say what you're talking about is largely imagined. Can you um, talk a bit about the, the robustness? How sure are you of this? I mean, mm -hmm. we know, for example, that mental health has been destigmatized in the last mm -hmm. 10, 15 years. Now, that's by and large <coughs> a very good thing. So people are way, way more likely to report mental health mm -hmm. problems now. Um, and right. the phrase, it's OK not to be OK, is now fairly standard amongst young people. So might it be that what you're observing is just simply the end of the stigma uh, and the people being a bit more open-minded, a bit more recognizing that people can come in and out of good or bad mental health, rather than a tech-induced breakdown of childhood. Certainly. So um, that seemed like a plausible hypothesis to me um, while I was writing The Righteous Mind with Greg Lukianoff. But once we found all the data on self-harm and suicide, um, now that explanation no longer works. So you know what you're suggesting, and this is what many people said all the way up. Some people still say it today, very few though. 
but before COVID, a few medical people were saying, ah, oh, no, it's you know, just what you said. It's just that they're, they're, they're self-diagnosing at higher rates, but it's not an, it's not an underlying change, change in mental health. Um, but why is it then? Right around 2013, in the US, Canada, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, all these girls suddenly start checking in to psychiatric inpatient units. Um, all, suicide, they're making many more suicide attempts. Uh, the, the level of self-harm goes up by two or three hundred percent, two or three hundred percent increases, especially for the younger girls, age 10 to 14. Um, so no, that idea that it's just a change in self-report doesn't hold any water because we see very much the same curves at the same time for behavior, and suicide certainly is not a self-report variable. So no, this is real. This is the biggest, uh, well, it's certainly the biggest mental health crisis in, in all of known history uh, for kids. Um, and I, I need to collect the data on, uh, you, know, uh, you know, how many kids died from COVID, how many kids died even from polio. Um, the increased number of suicides since 2010 is so large that I suspect this is uh, among, the, among the largest public health threats to children since the major diseases were wiped out. Well, I could talk about this all day, but sadly we have to wrap it up now. I mean, Jonathan, it's great to see you working away in your book. When can we expect it? It's Life After Babel, it's called, isn't it? Yes. March 26th is when it comes out in the U.S. I believe it'll come out in the U.K. at the same time. And I'm just making arrangements now um, for a visit to the U.K. I'll probably be in London on um, April 29th, of that week, whatever that week is of April 29th. Well, we can all so save the I hope date. there'll be some events in London. I hope to, to see some of you then and there. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Please, everybody, join me in thanking Jonathan Heiss. Um,